Okay, so next up, we've got Aaron Lee from Solace. So as a developer advocate in Solace's office of the CTO, Aaron evangelizes Solace technology and conveys developer feedback to Solace's engineering team. Aaron has been at Solace for over nine years. He enjoys coding Java and JavaScript, building demos and integration mashups, helping customers and developers realize the benefits of event-driven architectures and APIs, and how they complement traditional RESTful APIs. Before Solace, Aaron was a developer with Laris Technologies, where he consulted with the Canadian Army on NATO sensor data applications. Aaron holds a bachelor's degree with honors in mathematics and a master's degree in computer science, both from Carleton University in Ottawa. And with that, we're going to uh, go over to Aaron. He's going to talk about the evolution of APIs. So there you go, Aaron. All right. Hey, thanks, Dan. Uh, can you hear me all right? Is this is this OK? Am I on? Can hear you, can hear you fine. All right, excellent. And you can see my slide, my title slide there, yeah? Yes. Okay, okay great. OK. Hi, everybody. Yeah, Aaron from Solace here. Thanks for that great introduction, Dan. Uh, it's usually more information than I like to give. <laughs> Um, happy to be here and happy to talk uh, with you today about uh, events, event-driven uh, architectures, applications, and the async API uh, spec. Um, I'm from a company called Solace. We're uh, oh, let me let me uh, get this going here. Click on the right thing. Come on. Oh, there we go. All right. So I'm from a oh, back that up. I'm from a company called Solace. Uh, we're a Canadian company, have been in business for about 20 years, uh, building uh, the world's best uh, event-driven messaging uh, technology. We have uh, you know, offices around the world. I'm based in Singapore, um, and we have a booth in the Partners Village. Come and talk to us afterwards if you want to hear uh, more details or get a demo or anything uh, along those lines. All right, so events are important, right? The universe is event-driven. Everything in the world happens in a cause and effect uh, kind of situation. You know, an inventory system gets updated. That's an event. You know, an IoT sensor uh, fires. Uh, that's an event. You know, stock market prices are ticking along. These are events. The world is event-driven. You know, modern enterprises are turning towards if not fully embracing event-driven architectures for reasons of scale, for reasons of uh, business real-time value uh, for reasons of cost. You know, um, as we move towards a more real-time system, customers and partners are demanding more and more real-time access to their data um, because, and there's a huge amount of value uh, in being real-time, uh, you know, rather than kind of the more traditional database-oriented, batch-oriented uh, systems. So events are important, right? But before we get into that, Let's just rewind a little bit. I am I am a software developer. I like to look at things kind of through a developer uh, lens. You know, back in the day when I first started coding, uh, software I think was actually easier. You know, we had these monolithic systems, uh, typically very database oriented, batch oriented systems. Um, there were you know, the, in terms of you know, if you want to communicate between uh, different methods or different instances within your application, you know, if you're within the same JVM, you just call a method on that instance. And you know, off, uh, there's your method. But as we start to decompose these monolithic systems into microservices, you know, as is you know the kind of uh, current flavor of the day, uh, communication between these microservices actually gets more complicated. You know, they could be running in different places, different um, you know different servers. Where are they running? Are they being scaled? How do we call them and access them? Uh, communication between them, uh, you know, gets more complex. And as we also move towards more real time, right? So, you know, when I used to deposit a check in the bank, it would take a week for it to clear, then maybe a few days. Now, you know, we demand our money uh, available instantaneously. Same with topping up your mobile phone. Same with an inventory system. You know, what good is it that if it's only updated at the end of the day? You know, there's so much value to have a more real time system. But of course, traditional batch oriented systems can't sometimes cope with this load. So there's a need to uh, rethink some of these architectures. As so, you know, this whole decomposition into monolithic uh, microservice oriented systems, the, their need for more real time is really driving a lot of the requirements in terms of kind of modernizing our event driven uh, architectures. You know, also back in the day, you know, the internet was simple. I started learning HTML in 1995. And back then, you know, you had uh, an Apache web server, you had a, a Netscape browser, and, you know, you typed index.html and you did a, you got a web page. 
Um, but as internet applications moved in, or as applications moved into the cloud, you know, um, how do we make these things communicate? You know, the internet is built on REST. You know, REST over HTTP, everything understands it. Uh, from your 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 web servers to your load balancers, proxies, firewalls. So in terms of a, a communication protocol for uh, internet-based applications, it seemed like a really good fit. And even today, almost all microservice architectures are defined as you know restful uh, REST over HTTP. But is it always the best choice? You know, um, there is you know a need for more bidirectional asynchronous communication, which is why WebSockets got invented, you know, things, protocols like MQTT, we're gonna talk a little bit about that later. And hopefully the adoption of these uh, more modern protocols in terms of microservice architectures. So what does it mean to be event driven? Well, my definition, you know, if I had to say, would be something along these lines. It would be more real time, uh, more reactive, uh, asynchronous, non-blocking and decoupled or loosely coupled. There's a lot of advantages to these types of things in terms of uh, efficiency and in terms of you know, uh, you know, value to business. Now you might say, well, can I use REST? This is an API days conference. You know, people are very comfortable and very familiar with REST over HTTP and REST is great. You know, everything understands REST as we said, but REST architecture by definition is client server, right? You're calling from your browser into a backend server. You're calling some server. It's point to point, you know, in the sense that uh, HTTP is put, you're, you're talking to a specific uh, URL or, or URI. And HTTP at a network level is actually a synchronous protocol. So, uh, you know, you, you make a post or a get and you have to wait for that 200 OK or that 501 or whatever to come back from the other side. So some limitations there. And so REST is not always the best. You know, it's great for synchronous interactions when you need to ensure that you submit something to a database or, or you know, you're querying something and you're expecting a response. You want a blocking call. Um, externally facing APIs, they're well-defined. But, you know, it does, uh, you know, promote a tight point-to-point -point coupling and it's not natively uh, event-driven. So uh, REST is not always best. You don't have to just take this from me. This is a this is a screenshot from a recent MuleSoft blog. You know, MuleSoft's quite a big name in the API space. Um, moving from RESTful to Eventful, and here's the URL uh, if you want to check that out. Um, and it's not just you know like a complete departure from RESTful uh, kind of architectures into eventing. It's always a kind of a combination. It's the best of both worlds, and having these two kind of styles of interactions and architectures mesh together well. Now, Boomi uh, is actually one of our preferred partners, but Solus works with a number of different technologies, Solus being a broker that can also support JMS. We work with uh, companies like Mule, uh, even uh, Tipco Businessworks, for example. We can talk and help modernize these kind of uh, ways of getting your, your business uh, kind of integrations uh, happening in more of a real time and more of a distributed kind of way. Now, Boomi is an integration platform as a service. They're one of our partners. I'm not here to pitch them, but they're pretty cool. They have this very cool kind of um, kind of connector technology that allows them to integrate with tons and tons and tons of different types of software out there, stuff that Solus doesn't talk to natively. But underpinning that, Solus becomes the event-driven backbone to allow you to kind of like unlock the data from all these kind of disparate siloed systems and publish the, you know, these changes, these updates as events onto a Solus event mesh that then gets routed through your enterprise to other places in the business that maybe want to listen to an inventory update, a shipping update, you know, an HR update, things like this. Things of you know, traditional systems that don't necessarily talk to each other, getting value out of kind of unlocking that data and getting that data in motion across your enterprise using the Solus uh, event mesh technology. You'd be able to like kind of bridge from on-prem into your cloud, into multi-cloud, hybrid cloud, uh, having Solus as a technology that basically moves this data between any of these different systems um, and using something like Boomi, using something like Mule, allows you to talk to all these kind of different endpoints that maybe not don't necessarily talk uh, a Solus protocol or one of the kind of the open standard eventing uh, protocols that we're going to talk about in just a second. Now, as a coder, you know, if I was going to think about like event-driven software design, um, you know, if you've ever done any GUI programming, you know, like uh, Java Swing or JavaScript, 
um, you know, you've probably done event-driven coding, right? Every time you click a button or move a window or resize something, you know, events are being fired by that GUI framework up to the application for it to respond to, you know, say, hey, I've been clicked, do something. Uh, back in high school, we used to make video games, right? Same kind of thing. Every time you move the joystick or touch the fire button, you're responding to these events. And events are very common in kind of, you know, just human normal interaction kind of ways. The alarm clock goes off, I react to it, I, wait, I turn it off. You know, the light turns green, I hit the gas pedal. You know, I'm reacting to these events. Every time you push an elevator button or tap your credit card to make a purchase, these are events that maybe have some business value in your system. Now, in terms of development, you know, we don't always think about, you know, as coders, we don't always think about, um, you know, learning how to code in an event-driven way because it's actually a little bit complicated. You know, we typically get taught uh, in more of a service-oriented uh, design. You know, you call a method, you know, the method gets put onto the stack, it runs some, you know, computation, and then when it's done, you know, you get a response back uh, on that thread, um, you know, that the method is completed. But if you're doing event-driven coding, typically you're going to be using the you know, callbacks or promises, things that kind of respond back on a different thread at a later point once this asynchronous, uh, you know, computation or method has completed. So event-driven uh, software is typically non-blocking, typically uses callbacks. Let's take a look at some patterns that you might recognize maybe from your uh, university days. The observer pattern is, you know, what's typically used in GUIs. This is the GUI pattern. You know, you'll have a subject. This could be your, your button that it wants to be, you know, clicked. You'll have your observer. This is your application that wants to listen or be notified of when that button gets clicked. And, you know, every time that button is clicked, yeah, it runs this method called notify observers. And we tell the application or whoever wants to listen to that particular object, um, the subject, that something has happened. You know, this is a, a very efficient way of designing software. You don't pull, right? Um, the more traditional database-oriented way of programming is you pull the database to find out if things have changed. But I mean, that's, it, it, it's, it's not efficient. You know, querying something, you know, to find out if it's changed, why not just have the thing tell me when something has changed? So this particular pattern is very efficient um, and comes up a lot in event-driven systems. The reactor pattern, this is typically used in more uh, I.O. style A APIs. Uh, the Solus APIs actually use this, where you know, Nginx actually uses this. You have a, a web server that is listening to requests coming in. You know, these could be web pages. These could be anything. These could be computations. And rather than having a thread that's listening to that socket, you know, kind of performing these responses, uh, it will delegate. It will pass these jobs into some backend uh, worker threads you know, these are scalable up and down based on load. And so that keeps your, your current re reactor thread here, this event loop, very uh, responsive. You know, if, if you have something that's long running computation, if this guy was processing it, it would jam everything up. So um, different patterns uh, for how to deal with uh, scalable event driven systems. The publish subscribe pattern, this is fairly well known. Now, this is not a a software design pattern. This is an architectural pattern. Um, and this is a communication pattern for event-driven systems. And it's similar to the observer pattern, except that um, instead of, uh, you know, you'll have a, an event broker kind of sitting in the middle, allowing communication between uh, producers of events and consumers of events. And rather than registering directly with each other, as in the observer pattern, um, they'll use topics of interest to route data between each other. So consumers will subscribe to a particular topic that when they want to be notified. Producers, when they generate an event, you know, that you know, credit card has been tapped or whatever happens, it will send a message as an event on that particular topic. And typically something in the middle, such as a, an event broker or a message broker, will then route that data to the various consumers as required. So this promotes a decoupled architecture. The producers and the consumers don't necessarily know about each other and allows you to scale the number of producers and consumers uh, independently of each other uh, by letting the event broker here in the middle, the man in the middle, kind of take care of all that stuff. So this is what Solace is. Solace is an event broker. Um, it's a middleware component that allows you to transmit data and events between producers and consumers using a variety of data exchange patterns. 
You know, people are uh, pub publish subscribe is the one we just talked about, kind of one to many. Uh, people that are familiar with queuing systems like uh, IBM MQ also know about point to point, kind of one to one style communication. Request reply as well, you know, which is your more typical, um, uh, you know, API style of communication where you're always expecting a response. And have other, other types of uh, data patterns as well, you know, being able to replay data. And your event broker should allow efficient, you know, bi directional and, and asynchronous uh, communication. Now, there are a lot of players in this space. You know, if you look at this map here, uh, you'll probably recognize quite a few of these logos. Uh, some are on prem only, some are cloud only, some are, you know, IoT only. Uh, and there's, you know, very few that actually kind of run the gamut in terms of types of uh, all the different messaging patterns and different spaces. There's only very, very few uh, that support all this. Now, if you have any of these particular logos in your enterprise and you want to know how Solus compares, come over and talk to us in our partner booth village thing. Now, in terms of communication between uh, you know, these brokers and their clients or their applications, there are a number of different protocols and standards as well. Now, the reason that you know, REST over HTTP is so well uh, supported is that you know, HTTP is a standard. It's the standard that you know, defined the internet. And back in the day, there were no standards around message-driven or eventing kind of protocols. But in more recent years, these have actually formed and crystallized. So uh, we have MQTT. This is very popular in the IoT space. But it's a nice, lightweight pub-sub uh, protocol that is uh, showing up more and more in kind of uh, client-facing external uh, APIs. Um, you know, Lufthansa, for example, has an MQTT socket you can go and plug into and just get data streamed out to you rather than having to make an API kind of RESTful request reply. AMQP is another one, Advanced Message Queuing Protocol. This is a 1.0 standard uh, that is supported by Red Hat, Microsoft, uh, Solus, a bunch of others. It defines how these things communicate. And then because these are wireline standards, it means you can kind of choose the best of breed, you know, whether it is, um, you know, it's kind of like in REST, um, HTTP as a standard allows you to take an Nginx web server and replace it with an Apache web server or vice versa and use a different browser, you don't have to always use a Chrome browser with a Chrome web server or an Nginx browser with an Nginx web server. Standards allow you kind of interoperate between different types of systems and different, uh, and different uh, technologies. Of course, supporting REST is always important in the internet. Web sockets for bi-directional. JMS is a standard, but it's not a protocol. It is a API standard but it's very, very common in enterprise integration. So you want to make sure that you support a broad number of these different standards. Now, in terms of routing data between applications, uh, you know, using publish subscribe, using publish pub sub as the event-driven communication paradigm, uh, it's all using topics. Now, some people that, you know, use JMS or some people that use Kafka are like, okay, I know what a topic is, but not necessarily. Topics are just concepts. And so how topics are actually implemented in a particular broker really depends on the broker. Now in Solus, topics are actually very powerful, very descriptive, and very uh, useful in terms of routing uh, for some of the reasons uh, you'll see here. Uh, topics in Solus are more than just a flat label. They are a hierarchical kind of description of the data that is inside the payload. So let's say you have some kind of, well, the example here, uh, let's say you have some kind of status message coming from a particular server. Uh, the topic that is describing it, you know, when you publish that message, the topic could be system slash status slash host one slash statistics. And this, just by the topic alone, gives you a pretty good idea what is inside that message. What is the payload of your message? And it's through, um, through uh, using the topic that Solus will then route that data to the consumers of interest. And how do we do that? Well, if topics are so variable, you know, you could have different uh, levels. You know, each level could be a different thing. Um, we use the concept of wildcards. So Solus has these topic wildcards as a subscriber to allow you a single subscription to match multiple uh, topics that are being published on. So, for example, the the star wildcard here is a, what we call a single level wildcard. So, regardless of which host, if you know, if the host is level three. I put a star there, then regardless of which host uh, I'm publishing on, this particular subscription will receive all system status statistics information. 
Sol also has the concept of a multi-level wildcard, a, a greater than, which kind of you stick at the end. And it essentially means that no matter what comes after this, if I've matched up until that level, uh, then I want to just uh, match the rest of that uh, particular thing. Now in Solus, you can actually combine these, and the star is actually a prefix wildcard, so you can actually specify the first couple letters. Now these actually, people that are familiar with MQTT per, perhaps, uh, these will look quite familiar to some of the MQTT wildcards, uh, plus and, and hash, uh, slightly different, and uh, I don't have time to get into the details, but if you want to come talk to us later, uh, please do. So topics are important, right? But how do we actually, can we actually do code generation from a topic schema? Now, people that are familiar with Swagger or OpenAPI, you know, using an API platform, uh, this probably looks quite familiar, right? You'll have an API portal where you document your particular RESTful APIs. Um, you know, it generates uh, documentation. You can do governance. You can do analytics. You know, how, like which call, which are being called the most. Um, you know, and that will tie into your API gateway, your gateway um, through which your applications kind of connect into. Uh, architects and developers can browse and use your API portal to look for this kind of stuff. So this exists and it's very well defined for the RESTful, uh, you know, REST over HTTP space. But what about events? Well, we don't have that for events really until recently. So async API is an open source initiative. Um, you know, it is uh, basically very similar to open API uh, in the sense for RESTful, but allows you to define an event driven specification. Uh, where you have publishers and subscribers, and they are using um, topics. You can see here this channel, uh, topics to route data between different applications. So I can now define, uh, using this API spec, uh, applications uh, for that. So what Solus has come up with recently, we launched it back in uh, April, is an event portal. So everything that you would expect from an, uh, uh, an API portal, we've built for the event-driven world. So the ability to discover, the ability to define, to on paper define your event-driven applications, their interactions, the schemas that they're using, and you know, the interactions between them, which will allow you to then kind of combine it with the runtime event broker at the bottom. Solace here being the broker, or we're tying into Kafka, we are tying into MQTT brokers as well to provide real-time analytics and auditing of the data as it flows over the, uh, over the broker. So having the event portal where you can kind of manage, document, um, discover, use the library function to search for what types of events are there um, allows you to do this stuff. Now, I don't have much time left. I got like two minutes. So I'm very, very quickly going to say, um, hopefully this works. This is, uh, this is the Solus Cloud Console. Uh, this is uh, where you know, we provide interactions to allow you to like, fire up uh, brokers in the cloud if you want to use Solus in the cloud. But it's also where we have our event portal. And this is free to sign up, free to try. This is actually my personal account, so it's a little bit uh, empty. But if you head over to the designer, uh, when you first sign up for Solus, you get this one kind of demo uh, kind of designer application here called Acme Rideshare. You can come in here and start to just browse around of the data that's in here. So I have these different applications that you can define. You define the events that go between them, ride accepted, ride requested. You can see which one is generating and which one is receiving. Here's a trip updated event. And inside, if I double click on this, you can take a look at you know, who created that particular event, when it was created, um, what the schema is for it. Take a look at the... Uh, schema here. This is using JSON schema for this particular example. So you can look at the, the uh, contents of the, the payload. Here is the topic up at the top here. So you can see that it's a very, very, very descriptive, you know, with these multiple levels. I'll have the domain, the type of what type of data this is, maybe a, uh, an event version, you know, the schema type, um, and then some variables. You know, I can have variables every time I publish you know, a different driver ID, a different trip ID. Um, so it can be very, very dynamic in the types of topics. Very different than Kafka topics. You know, Kafka people, uh, you know, think of topics in, as a log file uh, on a server because that's how they're implemented. But topics in Solus are very much more uh, fine-grained, allow you to do fine-grained filtering uh, based on these, um, based on these, uh, uh, I guess, what, what can I say, uh, topics. Now, very quickly, I don't have, I have enough time for this. Uh, if I go into the application side very quickly, 
um, take a look at the kind of different apps that I have defined here. Um, you can see, for example, I have this billing application. From here, I can actually go ahead and generate async API schema that I can then feed into a code generator. So go ahead and download this. Uh, I wonder if I have uh, time. I got a few minutes. So we got billing app.yaml. Let me just quickly pull up this. Um, let's see, code billing. Pull this into VS Code here. Just take a quick look at it. While that's loading, I'm just going to quickly pull up this particular slide. So this is, you know, people that are familiar with uh, OpenAPI, you have your Swagger information. You can then run that through a code generator, uh, which you can then import. It allows developers not to have to worry about all the boilerplate code, um, all the kind of like, you know, which API am I calling? It's basically kind of defined for you through the, uh, the code itself. And that's the same thing that's happening with the async API uh, specification is it allows you to specify the application in terms of the uh, topics and the payloads that are being, you know, this is slowly loading here, folks. Uh, it's because I'm running it within my WSL environment. Click, click, click. Aaron, do but, you want to uh, maybe answer a couple couple of questions sure. while we're waiting for that? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, great. Uh, fantastic. So Tom Chappell has asked, um, event-driven architecture looks great and very modern, but legacy systems may not be ready for sending out events for integration. Does this mean strategies like polling would be necessary whilst we continue to use such a system? So um, for example, most people that are familiar with databases and kind of batch-oriented systems are probably know about, you know, kind of change data capture systems. Right? Oracle has, you know, Golden Gate, there's other technologies like this. There are uh, ways of kind of taking these non-traditionally eventing oriented systems and kind of plugging into them, tapping into the data uh, that go into them to allow them to be able to generate events or to be able to send things. There are numerous technologies. If you don't, if you don't have a greenfield project that you can define or design, as event driven from the outset, there are many multitude uh, myriad ways of kind of integrating with some of these technologies to kind of turn them to allow them to do eventing. Um, Boomi as an example of one of our partners there, um, you know, but there's a ton of other companies out there that basically will tap into these systems, listen for events. SAP, for example, you know, they're very traditional, um, but there are technologies and companies and partners working with them that will allow that will tap in uh, to the SAP ecosystem, and every time a system is updated, it will actually trigger an event, which can then, you know, become a Solus message or become a an event-driven message on on an event broker. So, um, yeah, that was a little bit rambling. Sorry, was that? Uh... <laughs> there we go. I think we got one minute left. So, all right, I'm just zooming in here. Um, just to show you a quickly example of what this uh, um, what this billing app kind of looks like. Um, so you know this is this is this is the async API schema. Again, this is not a Solus is a partner with these guys. So is MuleSoft. So is Tipco. Um, you know we're a number of big companies, uh, well, big and small companies that are partnered with async API, um, trying to redefine um, and provide standards and specifications around how to build event-driven uh, applications. So I can now come along here with my, my uh, async API schema. Apologies for my VS code going so slow, but I can now take this and run this through a code generator and basically build a node application or a Java swing application or you know, a Go application, Python, whatever, um, that can then you know, kind of just connect to whatever broker you need and publish and subscribe and know how to kind of decode the various payloads that are coming out of it. So asyncapi.org uh, for more information on that. Uh, great open source uh, project that we're really hoping uh, takes off. Um, again, come and talk to us at our, at our booth uh, if you want to hear, hear more about the event portal. Um, I'll stick around for a few more minutes if there's other, if there's other questions, but uh, thanks very much. Thanks, Dan, yeah, for, for hosting. And 
Awesome. Thanks, Aaron. Unfortunately, we have to move on to the next speaker, but if people, there are a few more questions, but I think people can catch up with you at the booth, right? At the Solace booth. There. So um, yep. I, would, I would recommend that. So thank you very much, Aaron, for a fantastic presentation there. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.